Thank you for coming to this month's Tech Talk. My name is Tirza Abbott. I am the manager of the SEM facility here at the Nuance Center. And, and I'm Nick Gagola. I'm the assistant core scientist here at the SEM facility. And Nick and I are going to walk you through how you would choose the best SEM for your sample or your experiment, because we have a number of different SEMs at the Nuance Center, and they all have different capabilities. So um, <clears throat> to start, if you're here, uh, you probably have used or plan on using an SEM here at Nuance. SEM, first of all, stands for Scanning Electron Microscope. It is a widely utilized and I would say essential mode of materials characterization. Um, so you may have visited our website and seen that we have five different SEMs. Four are pictured here, but we actually have two represented by this image, the Hitachi S4800 uh, and SU8030. And you may receive advice from some of your colleagues on which SEM you should train on, but if you are interested in learning an SEM at Nuance, we actually have you fill out a survey that gives us information about you and your material so that we can help determine which microscope is best for you. And based on that information that you give, we use the criteria that we're going to explain in this presentation to determine which microscope is best. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will better understand kind of our thought process when picking the best SEM for your analysis. So what we're going to discuss today is first some background. What is an SEM and how does it work? Different electron detectors. So the imaging that pro is produced through an SEM depends on its detectors. So we'll talk a little bit about those. The different advanced SEM modes and techniques that our instruments have to offer. And then the different SEMs available at Nuance. So to start, this is one of our SEMs on the left here at Nuance. This is the whole instrument right here. This is the Quanta 650F. And the main part up here is composed primarily of two major parts, the specimen chamber. So this is where you'll actually load a small sample in the chamber where it's held under high vacuum and the electron column. <clears throat> so at the top of the electron column is our electron gun. This is the source of our high energy electrons. The electrons are then accelerated down the column where they interact with electromagnetic lenses and apertures to create a small spot or probe. That probe enters the specimen chamber and interacts with the specimen. And the interaction of this high energy beam with the specimen results in the emission of a number of different signals that can be detected by whatever detectors you have attached to the chamber walls. And so it's called a scanning electron microscope because the beam is rastered across the sample surface, collecting the intensity of different signals at each beam position or pixel to generate an image on your computer screen. So um, we're gonna go through kind of the major components of the SEMs, starting with the electron gun. Now, if you've been through an SEM training or will be through an SEM training in the future, we don't go into too much detail about the different types of electron guns. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this today. There are kind of two classes of electron sources, um, the thermionic sources on the left and field emission sources. So thermionic emitters use an electrical current to heat up a source, in this case, a tungsten filament. Heating the source lowers the work function of the material, so electrons are readily drawn off of the filament and down the column. So this is what a standard thermionic source tungsten filament looks like. And the tungsten tip is actually relatively large, the tip right here, compared to its counterparts over here. And so it has an initial wide diameter, which can result in lower imaging resolution. You can see the source diameter is larger, but you still get a lot of electrons, so you get high brightness. One of the downsides is that you have a large energy spread. So what does that mean? That means that not all of the electrons leaving the source have the same energy. And so that can uh, cause a reduction in your overall resolution, but this type of source does produce a pretty stable beam current. Now, before I continue, I just want to kind of explain what I mean by resolution. 
in the SEM, when we think about resolution, we're actually trying to, or we actually are thinking about the ability to resolve or differentiate in this case, these two points. And so in order to achieve the highest resolution possible in the SEM, you want your probe to be as big or smaller than the smallest feature that you want to analyze. Um, so if we want to achieve higher resolution, we can uh, go on to our, our use a field emission source. But before we go on there, I'll just say a few more facts about the tungsten thermionic sources. They do get changed about every 100 hours. So it's pretty easy You just pop one out and put in a new one. So their lifetime is not very long compared to the field emitters. Now, <clears throat> the field emitting uh, emission sources use a very sharp tungsten crystal tip that's held at a really high positive extraction voltage generated at this first anode to create a very strong electric field. So that electric field lowers the energy barrier electrons need to overcome to escape. And this allows the electrons to tunnel down the column and be accelerated by this second anode in the assembly. And there are kind of two categories of field emitters. The first is the cold cathode field emitter. These are not heated. They're actually kept at room temperature. Here's a picture of the pointed tungsten crystal. And because it has a really, really tiny tip, um, the source diameter is very small. And so you get probably the highest spatial resolution imaging with this type of source, along with pretty high current and a very low energy spread. That means that most of the electrons leaving the tip are leaving with close to the same energy. The problem with this type of source is that over time, because it's held at room temperature, it can absorb gas molecules on the surface, and this can cause instabilities in the beam current. And so you have to flash it or heat it up about every 12 hours to get rid of those absorbed gas molecules and clean it off. So it's not the best for things like microanalysis, which if you're not familiar with, we'll talk about later. And so, uh, well, the other advantage, I guess, of, of these types of sources is that they last for a really long time. I've been here at Nuance for about six years. We have two cold field em emission guns, and I've never had to replace the source, um, which is different than the thermionic source, which we replace about every 100 hours. One of the, I would say, most popular sources today, if you go to buy an SEM, you probably will buy this type of source, is the Schottky field emitter, sometimes called the heat-assisted field emission gun because they are heated to about 100 uh, or 1800 Kelvin. They're coated with a zirconium oxide tip, which further reduces the work function, function of the material. And it also has this nifty little zirconium oxide reservoir. So as the zirconium oxide coating goes away, it can recode itself over time. They do only last for about two to three years. So if you use one of our shock emitters at Nuance every about two to three years, you'll see it go down for about a week for an emission change. Um, but these sources kind of have the best of everything. They have that really small tip, so a small source diameter for high resolution imaging, lots of current, so they're great for microanalysis. And because it's heated at a consistent temperature, this, the beam current is very stable. And again, you have that really small energy spread. So this is an overview of the gun. Um, after the gun, we will pass the electron beam down the electron column where it passes through a series of electromagnetic lenses and apertures. This, these are used to reduce the diameter of the electron source to a very small spot inside the chamber. So the lenses are made of a ferromagnetic material and wound copper wire. The beam passes through it and the magnetic field emitted from this um, lens uh, crosses over or changes the trajectory of the electrons to cross over to a fine point. There are two kind of um, different electromagnetic lens assemblies in the column. The first is our condenser lens that's higher up in the column. And this does exactly that. It condenses the probe to its first crossover. Um, and <clears throat> changing the current running through the condenser lens uh, changes the height of the crossover, which can affect your overall beam current and your resolution in the sense that it changes the overall probe diameter or spot. So if you use a really weak condenser lens strength, you can have a really low crossover. If you have a strong condenser lens strength, you can get a very high crossover. This is for high resolution imaging. 
Um, so that's the condenser lens. After the condenser lens and the objective lens aperture, it passes through the objective lens. And the objective lens, changing the current through this lens, changes the final crossover of the beam at the specimen surface. So when you're sitting at the microscope, you see an image and you want it to be as clear as possible, you turn the focus knob, um, and this changes the crossover height to either under focus or over focus. Of course, you want the beam to cross over at the sample surface, so you're in the best focus possible. That's where you get the smallest probe. All right. So um, after we've passed through the column, we get to the specimen chamber where the beam finally interacts with the sample. Um, that's this big chamber right here. You can see the little bug right in there. Um, the specimen chamber is pumped to high vacuum to remove any gas in the path of the electron beam. When the beam interacts with the specimen, it scatters and creates this teardrop-shaped interaction volume. And there are a number of interactions that take place, resulting in a number of different signals that you can detect depending on the detectors attached to the SEM. And Nick's going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so different signals can escape from different regions within this interaction volume. And I'm going to talk about these different signals in a second. But one of the things I just want to point out is that it's a very common misconception that SEM is always a very surface sensitive analysis, when in fact, high energy electrons scatter and can scatter pretty deep into a material, depending on the material properties and your uh, operating or accelerating voltage or the velocity of the energy of the beam. So the greatest effect on your interaction volume size is actually your accelerating voltage. So what I'm about to show you is a Monte Carlo simulation of random electron scattering in two different types of materials. Well, one on the left is gold and uh, on the right is carbon. And so this is a uh, Monte Carlo simulation at five kV. You can see the interaction volume or the random scattering of electrons is not very deep, but is a little deeper in the carbon. If we increase the accelerating voltage, that will the size of the interaction volume will also increase more so in our lighter material or low Z material carbon over here. And then finally, at thirty kV, you can see there's a significant difference. So if you want to know what that interaction volume looks like in your material, you can also do this simulation. Um, but it's important to think about this interaction taking place with your specimen because, again, different signals come from with different regions within this interaction volume. So depending on what you're trying to collect or analyze, you want to think about this in terms of selecting your, your accelerating voltage. Um, so <clears throat> this leads to our two most commonly used, or actually the two probably only imaging uh, signals that you use in an SEM, secondary electrons and backscattered electrons. So secondary electrons are the result of inelastic interactions of the electron beam with your sample, knocking out uh, loosely bound electrons. These electrons are very low energy and tend to or really only can escape from the near surface of the material. And more secondary electrons can escape from edges in highly topographic materials. So the secondary electron signal is primarily utilized to get surface information or topography. So this is a guitar string right here. And you can see the surface texture. You can also see brighter regions where more signal is escaping, um, showing the really nice topographic features. Backscattered electrons um, are the result of elastic collisions of the electrons with the atoms in your material. This changes the trajectory of the primary beam electrons. They don't lose a lot of energy and heavier materials scatter uh, or backscatter more strongly than lower Z materials. So in this example here, silicon is going to produce fewer backscattered electrons than gold would. And I like using this uh, guitar string again as an example, because at first you could see, well, I saw the bright uh, metal regions here and wondered what the dark stuff was and later realized that it was probably just carbon crud from being used, which is a little gross, but it's a very nice example of uh, backscattered electron imaging. So we talked a little bit about interaction volume and the energy of these two different signals. Uh, secondary electrons are very low energy, backscattered electrons are very high energy, and so backscattered electrons can escape from much deeper within the material. 
And so this is a nice example of an aluminum copper alloy showing that there's still some residue or artifacts from the polishing. You can see some of the dark spots, the carbon crud from just it being an old and dirty sample. Whereas in the backscattered electron image, you don't see that the crud on the surface because our signal is coming from much deeper within the material. All right, so uh, one more kind of side bit about these different types of signals before Nick starts talking about the different types of detectors that we have to offer. It's important to know what types of uh, signals um, or varieties of signals we are detecting or can filter using these special detectors. And so um, if you have taken an SEM training or plan to, this will be covered in your training, but it's important to point out that secondary electrons have a few different flavors. Again, secondary electrons can only escape from the near surface of this interaction volume, and the highest resolution secondary uh, electron signal we call SE1s. So again, these escape from the near surface. They are low energy. They get attracted to our detector, but they're not the only secondary electrons that are collected by the detector. You can also get what are called SE2s. SE2s are backscattered electrons that upon exiting the sample have enough energy to emit more or other secondary electrons. Um, these also hit the detector and they can provide some information like a traditional backscatter signal in the sense that you can get some compositional information, but it can also introduce some noise. But the uh, secondary electrons that produce the most noise are called SE3s. And those are backscattered electrons that hit components inside the chamber itself, create secondary electrons that are also accepted by the secondary electron detector. Backscattered electrons are not quite as complex. They can exit with different energies, but the most, I think, interesting thing about them is that the angle at which they exit the sample can tell you different pieces of information. So high angle backscatter signal it, along the optic axis gives you the really nice compositional contrast, whereas a uh, lower angle backscatter signal can give you some topographic information. And so some of our backscattered electron detectors can be, um, set up in a way to filter out different types of backscatter signal. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Nick to talk to you about the different types of electron detectors that we have at Nuance. All right. Thank you, Tirza. It was very informative. All right. So now that we know about the different types of signals that can be produced, let's go ahead and talk about the different ways that we can detect each of them. First, we're going to talk about the lower secondary electron detector, sometimes called the Everhart Thornley or EHT detector. This detector is able to detect all the different types of signals, so SE1s, 2s, 3s, and even some backscatters. It usually sits inside of the main chamber off to the side, sort of like this. Next, we have the in lens upper detector. So, this detector usually sits up inside the objective lens up here. Uh, and mainly only detects the SE1s and 2s and some backscattered electrons. It doesn't get too many SE3s being back up inside the column like that. It also has a signal varying mechanism, uh, which is sometimes called an EXB filter or an energy filter, which lets you switch between the secondary signals and the backscattered signals. So after that, we have a dedicated backscatter electron detector, which, as the name suggests, detects backscattered electrons usually sits at the base of the objective lens, though some of the instruments do have retractable backscatter detectors. So they may not always be inserted. And these are really great at showing compositional contrast. And then we'll have our stem detectors. So these detectors usually sit underneath the sample stage and they detect transmitted electrons. It's mainly used for low KV stem or scanning transmission electron microscopy. Then there's a few other types of detectors, such as low vacuum detectors and more. All right, so first up, we have our lower secondary electron detector. So when we probe our sample with our electron beam, all those types of signals that we talked about, SE1s, 2s, 3s, and backscattered electrons, are all going to be produced and fly around inside the chamber. Uh, and they're going to be attracted to our SE detector due to this biased Faraday cage, which uh, sits out here in front of the detector and is usually set to about a two or 300 volt bias. When the electrons hit this scintillator out in front, they make a small flash of light, which is sent down this light pipe and into a photomultiplier, 
where the light signal is multiplied. Then that signal is sent through a preamp before it's output on the computer screen, and that's how the secondary electron image is generated. Now, given the orientation of this detector, physically being off to the side and horizontal to the specimen here, we're going to see what looks like some shading in the image. So you can imagine you'll gather more signal from the side of the sample uh, or particle that's facing the detector and not as much signal from the side facing the opposite direction. So this gives the effect of your sample being illuminated from the side, almost like an oblique lighting source, which is very useful for analyzing the surface topography of your sample. Also, with shorter working distances, you won't be able to gather as much signal as well, although you do tend to see a reduced charging effects when using the lower detector. So here's a couple examples of the lower detector. You can see the directional illumination here. It almost looks like shadows on the surface of your sample. This gives us a lot of information about the surface topography without really using much effort. So all of our instruments here at Nuance have a lower secondary electron detector. So this will always be an option, no matter which of the instruments you're going to be working on. All right, and up next, we have our in-lens, or upper secondary electron detector, which works a little bit differently than the lower detector. So the upper detector actually sits up inside the objective lens. And when our beam interacts with our sample, it's going to make all those signals we mentioned before. And some of those signals are going to be drawn back up into the objective lens by a magnetic field where they can be detected. And that's going to be our SE1s, 2s, and some backscattered electrons. Now, this is where that signal varying mechanism, or EXB filter, comes in. This filter can have either a positive or a negative bias applied. Uh, and you can actually, uh, depending on which bias is applied, you can actually change which signal is going to be detected. So the positive bias is going to let those initial secondary electrons from your sample up to that detector, where they'll make a nice high resolution image. But if you switch that and put a negative bias on it, it's going to block out all of those initial SEs and only let those backscattered electrons pass through up to that filter. And then those backscattered electrons are going to interact with that filter, produce more SE2s up there, which those SE2s can then go off and be detected. And since those SE2s carry backscattered information, this can give us a sort of pseudo backscattered type image where we can see a little bit of compositional contrast. So that upper detector tends to give us higher resolution images because it blocks out those SE3s from the main chamber, which again, just add noise to your image. And it's also going to work better at shorter working distances. So it'll just block out more of those SE3s. It'll collect more of the SE1s and make your image look a little bit nicer. And it also tends to offer more even illumination of the sample than the lower detector does. This is because since the uh, detector is located directly above the sample, it almost looks sort of like the sun is shining right down on top of it. So it gets nice and evenly illuminated. So here's a quick example. You can see all these particles we have here are pretty evenly illuminated all the way around. There's no shadowing effect like we saw with that lower detector. And again, it looks like the sun is sort of shining right down on top of the sample. And over here, we can see the difference between the filter biases. So these are gold nanorods encapsulated in silicon with a positive bias in the top left, so this plus 300 volts. We're seeing our initial secondary electrons, which give us our surface level details. So you can see that silicone coating pretty well there. But if we look at the negative bias down in the bottom right, we are seeing the SE2s that were generated from those backscattered electrons that interacted with that filter. So we're getting a lot more compositional contrast from signal that's coming from farther down inside of the specimen. So here what that means is we're seeing the gold nanorods, which is the brighter part on the inside, and the darker region around it is going to be that lighter, lower Z silicon. So again, this is kind of a pseudo backscatter imaging. Um, and these detectors are going to be found on the 4800 and 8030, and also the 7900. But if you'd rather get real backscatter imaging, you want to use the backscatter electron detector. So this detector sits at the base of the pole piece or the objective lens, and again, isn't always inserted, so you might have to make sure to insert it before you try doing backscatter detection. Uh, like the name implies, this backscatter detector only detects backscattered electrons. Now, a lot of the newer backscatter detectors are semiconductor-based, meaning when a backscatter electron hits this detector, it's going to generate an electron hole pair where those electrons can be collected and measured to create the signal that gets output on your screen. 
These are typically broken up into either segments or concentric circles, which also allows for different types of directional sampling. And they also generally collect more signal than that negative bias in the upper detector, which means your image looks nicer and tends to show a little bit better compositional contrast as well. Although they tend not to work very well at short working distances or low beam energies. So here we've got a quick example. We can see a lot of compositional contrast in this image. The darker areas here are gonna represent lighter elements that don't produce a lot of backscattered electrons. And the brighter areas are gonna indicate heavier uh, elements. I believe this is titanium versus carbon in this case. So you can see the titanium is brighter and the carbon is going to be darker. So the 3400, Quanta, and 7900 are all going to have dedicated backscatter detectors, but the 3400 is the only one with that permanently inserted one. The Quanta and 7900 are going to have retractable detectors that need to be inserted. And the last one we're going to talk about here is going to be the stem detectors. So there's actually two types of stem collection. On the left, we have the dedicated stem detector, which sits below the stage itself, and it just collects transmitted secondary electrons. Both of these systems are going to be used to analyze thin samples on TEM grids so that we can transmit those electrons more easily. And the type on the right is actually just a stage insert that you can use which has a highly polished gold reflective surface here on the bottom, which essentially just redirects those transmitted electrons back up towards that lower SE detector. So the type of detector on the left can be found on the Hitachi SU8030, and the type on the right is what we're going to use in the 7900. This low KV stem allows you to perform powerful nanoparticle characterization with either reflected or transmitted imaging. And here's just an example of that. So we've got our reflected versus our transmitted on the right. And the stem detectors are really just going to work best with very high accelerating voltages, which again should give us really good resolution without worrying too much about charging because the samples are going to be very thin anyway. All right. And then I will go ahead and hand this back over to Tirza to talk some more about SEM modes and different techniques we can use with them. Thank you, Nick. Awesome. All right, so um, if you're using SEM, you probably will start with imaging using one or all of those detectors, but some of our SEMs have advanced modes or techniques. And so I'm gonna quickly go through all, uh, six of these techniques. So we actually have done a number of tech talks on these techniques. So I'm not gonna spend too much time with them, but I will have QR codes appearing where you can scan them and uh, be linked to the tech talk for more information. I'll also display all those QR codes at the end. So if you don't catch them in time, that's totally fine. You'll see them again. So I'm going to talk to you about variable pressure mode, sometimes called low vacuum mode, beam deceleration mode, x-ray microanalysis, electron backscatter diffraction or EBSD, in situ heating and cooling, and electron beam lithography. All right. So um, low vacuum mode or variable pressure mode is a method used to image um, non-conductive materials that tend to charge up. So let me explain a little bit further. And in, in traditional high vacuum SEM, the beam interacts with your sample and the signals are collected by your secondary electron detector and produce this really nice uh, image. But sometimes you have, or you're working with materials that are have insulating properties. And so what happens is uh, electrons that do not produce signals don't have any kind of grounding path through the stage. And so you get a buildup of negative charge on the surface of your sample. So in this example, this is called a radiolarian. They precipitate shells out of SiO2. And you can see the contrast is really high. There's some horizontal streaking. You sometimes see uneven brightness or image distortion. A common charging artifact is uh, drifting. So I have a lot of users that will come to me and say, my sample's moving in the SEM. And it's actually not. You're just creating a really nice electron mirror on the surface of your sample that's deflected the beam. Um, so what we can do to reduce the charging artifacts, actually the best way to uh, reduce charging artifacts is just to coat your material with something conductive. So we have a few different coders. Nick will talk more about those at the end. So you coat it with, say, gold. Um, this creates a nice grounding path for any extra negative charge buildup on the surface of the sample through the stage. 
Um, and also heavier elements have a higher secondary electron yield. So for your SE images, you're going to produce a really nice um, uh, lower or upper uh, detector image. But if you can't coat your sample or you don't want to, or you need to do some other types of analysis after you do your SEM imaging, you can use low vacuum or variable pressure mode. So how this works is it introduces a small amount of gas into the chamber. Now the gas will obstruct the mean free path of the electrons traveling through the chamber. So you will see what's called beam skirting. So this technique does come with a slight reduction in imaging resolution. Um, but you'll still have a negative charge buildup on the surface of your insulating material, but the primary beam electrons, along with secondary electrons that are ejected or backscattered electrons that are ejected from the sample, will interact with the gas inside the chamber and create a cascade of secondary electrons and a positively charged gas ion. So the special detector will attract the cascade of secondary electrons and also uh, the positively charged gas ion can fall back to the surface to reduce the negative charge buildup. And so with the same sample and this technique, you can see that the image looks a lot better. We don't see the charging artifacts anymore. And this is available on three of our SEMs, the Hitachi S3400, the Quanta 650, and the Joel 7900. They all use different low vacuum gases and so are ideal for different situations. And so I talk a little bit more about low vacuum mode in our heating and cooling tech talk. So you can scan this QR code to learn more about that if you are interested. All right, um, so we talked about interaction volume and those SE ones, those really nice surface sensitive signals. But if you have a high interaction volume because you're using a high accelerating voltage, or you just have a low Z material that is inherently going to have a larger scattering volume, no matter what accelerating voltage you use, um, <clears throat> you will not be able to achieve super high resolution imaging at low accelerating voltages if you want to get that surface sensitivity. And that's because the low KV or low energy beams passing or electrons passing through the lenses uh, are more likely to be distorted by the lenses. We call these lens aberrations. And so you'll get a kind of blurrier image. So one of the things that you can do in our SEMs, this is a technique that a lot of people actually don't know about, is you can apply a bias to the stage. If you apply a negative bias to the stage, you can use a higher accelerating voltage for the beam passing through the column. And the uh, bias on the stage reduces the landing voltage so that you're actually hitting the sample with maybe 0.5 kV. And that helps provide as much surface sensitivity as possible. And so the image on the right is a diatom. They precipitate shells out of SiO2 also. And this is the diatom at 5 kV. Now it's SiO2, the scattering volume at 5 kV is gonna be pretty large. And so the signals that we're getting are kind of uh, washing out the very surface sensitive information. But if we use 3 kV, and apply a 2 kV bias on the stage so that our landing voltage is 1 kV, the signals that we're getting are from the near surface, and we have that higher accelerating voltage passing down the column, so it's going to be less distorted by the lenses. So this is available on, well, technically you can apply a bias to all of the stages on our SEMs, but this really excels with an in-lens or upper secondary electron detector, which you'll find on the Hitachi S4800 and SU8030, as well as the Joel 7900F. Probably the most popular SEM technique out there is some form of X-ray microanalysis. We talked about imaging signals, um, but along with SEs and BSEs, X-rays are also just inherently ejected from this uh, electron beam specimen interaction. So why not collect those also? So when a high energy electron uh, hits the atoms that make up your sample, it can eject an inner shell electron. And that leaves a vacancy that leaves the atom very unstable. So in order to stabilize an outer shell electron, we'll fill this vacancy. And this transition is accompanied by the loss of energy in the form of an X-ray. And this X-ray carries an energy and wavelength that's characteristic of that specific transition and element. Um, and so we can measure those X-rays using two techniques. First is uh, EDS or energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. And this uh, looks at the characteristic X-ray energies. You can also use what's called WDS or wavelength dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, which uh, differentiates the X-rays based on their um, wavelength. 
So the EDS detector is made of a semiconductor device, which measures the electron hole pairs that are generated when the X-ray strikes the detector. And it measures all of the different elements essentially at the same time and provides you with this spectrum of um, counts or intensity on the y-axis and energy on the x-axis. And so again, each energy is characteristic of the elements that are in the sample. So you get these nice characteristic x-ray peaks. And from this spectrum, the software can then uh, calculate the composition or relative abundance of all the elements in your sample. You can also do spectral imaging. You can create an uh, EDS map to show the spatial distribution of different elements in your sample. Um, and EDS is a very fast and easy to use and wonderful technique, but it does have some limitations. And those limitations really are that they can't really tra um, detect trace elements. And they sometimes, you sometimes see peak overlaps when you have two elements like sulfur and molybdenum that have characteristic X-ray peaks at about the same spot on the spectrum. So the yellow here is your EDS spectrum. And this is where WDS comes in, which is a very useful technique that looks at just one X-ray at a time. So it's a serial technique. Um, and it uses a diffraction crystal uh, that diffracts the X-rays to the detector that's in a position specific to the wavelength of the X-ray. And if you do a spectral scan using the wave detector, you get much better spectral resolution. So you can start to deconvolute some of those peak overlaps. We did a tech talk on WDS last year. So if you want to know more about WDS, please use this QR code in the bottom right-hand corner. If you are interested in learning EDS and you've already learned or been through a training on an SEM, you can also sign up for our uh, Zoom EDS trainings. My next training is tomorrow morning. So if you uh, scan this QR code and sign up, you'll get an email from me by the end of the day to invite you to our training. Um, this, uh, the WDS, although the EDS is found on all of our microscopes, WDS is only available on the Hitachi S3400 and Joel 7900F. All right, another very popular technique, probably my favorite technique, is EBSD or electron backscatter diffraction. And this is where EDS is used to understand the chemical composition. This is used to understand the crystallography of your material. So this special detector is mounted on the side of the chamber wall and a polished specimen oriented at 70 degrees uh, is placed towards the detector here. Um, electrons strike the sample and are diffracted when Bragg's law is satisfied and hit the detector screen here and create this diffraction pattern or Kikuchi pattern, which is just a, uh, these pair of bands or lines which create a band represent the crystal planes in your lattice. And these patterns are collected for each uh, beam position or pixel as you're rastering across the sample. Um, the patterns are collected and indexed using an internal data database in the software. So you can get information on the um, crystal orientation. And so you get a diffraction of pattern again for each pixel. Here's an EDS map for iron of a steel. And then this is the same steel, but the EDSD map showing all the grains and there are even some twins. Um, so you get diffraction patterns for each pixel. It comes with an incredible amount of data that can be quantitative and used for understanding grain boundary characteristics, grain size, textures, and crystallographic preferred orientations and uh, deformation in your sample or in the crystals. So we hosted a uh, diffraction workshop with Oxford Instruments, both of our uh, both of the instru instruments that we have EDSD detectors, the Quanta 650 and the Joel 4700 FIB, which we didn't talk about today, um, have EBSD detectors uh, by Oxford Instruments. We did a workshop with them. I do a short talk on EBSD in more detail. So if you're interested to learn more about EBSD, please use this QR code to see that uh, video. Um, heating and cooling, again, we also did a tech talk on this, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. When we talk about cooling in this case, I'm not talking about cryo-SEM. We have a cooling stage for one of our microscopes that allows us to cool the stage maybe down to like minus 10 degrees C. Um, so we use low vacuum mode uh, or actually not low vacuum mode. With low vacuum mode, you can increase the pressure to about two tor. We actually use a mode called ESEM mode in our Quanta SEM that allows you to put up to five tor of gas in the chamber. And in this, in the Quanta, we use uh, water vapor as our low vacuum gas. And so um, in ESEM mode, if we cool down the stage to say minus two degrees C, 
we can, by lowering the temperature, um, increase the pressure of the water vapor inside the chamber and start to precipitate water inside the chamber. And so this is a really cool experiment because you can see in the SEM how your material interacts with water. Now, a question I'm asked all the time is, can I suspend my sample in water and image it? And the answer is no, you'll get a really nice image of a water droplet, but SEM, you see the surface information. You don't see through the material like you may with light optical microscopy. So this is the cooling stage capability that's available on the quanta, but it also on the quanta, there is a um, heating stage. So we have the Gatan Murano heating stage. Um, this can heat your sample up through resistive heating up to 950 degrees C. You can set recipes or ramping procedures so you can log the heating um, as it takes place. We have a heating stage that's flat for imaging, but we also have a special stage for EBSD. So you can heat up your sample and watch solid phase transformations occur. This is an example of heat treatment of an additively manufactured titanium alloy to show the onset of recrystallization of the beta grains. Now, there are some limitations with the heating stage. Um, you can't melt anything in the SEM and you can't evaporate anything. We don't want to turn the SEM into a metal evaporator. So you do need to be careful. Um, if you want to know more about the heating and cooling stages, again, please use this QR code to go see the tech talk specifically on these stages. And then the last technique I'm going to talk about is electron beam lithography. So um, if you use electron beam lithography in like NUFAB or a clean room, then you're already familiar with this. You can do it in the SEM also. How this works is you put a layer of PMMA um, or resist on usually a silicon substrate. You expose it to the electron beam in a uh, designated pattern that you set using a CAD file. It becomes, the PMMA becomes soluble, so you can develop it and remove it, exposing the substrate to where you will then um, deposit metal and lift off the remaining PMMA so that you're left with uh, whatever device or whatever pattern you chose to, to produce. And so this is a really unique technique um, that we offer. The first time I gave a talk on the SEMs available at Nuance about five years ago, it was one of the only available EV lithography systems. But since then, um, the new fab uh, or new fab has installed a really fancy EBL, the Wraith Voyager. So if you're interested in EBL, we recommend that you go talk to NewFab first. They have not only the right instrumentation, but the expertise. They have some uh, folks over there that are really great at EBL. So if you need EBL, talk to them. But if you do want to use the SEM, it is available on the Quanta 650. All right. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Nick to walk you through each of the SEMs that we have at Nuance. Um, and then that will be done. All right, thanks, Tirza. So those are going to be all of the SEM modes and techniques that our instruments have here. But let's go ahead and just give you a quick overview of what each individual SEM is capable of. All right, so the 4800 and the 8030 are like, they're kind of like sisters. They have a lot of things in common. They both have a CFEG electron gun or a cold field emission gun. And they both have double condenser optics, meaning they use two condenser lenses uh, in a row to make the electron probe much smaller. They both have in-lens upper detectors, uh, but the 8030 also has a top detector, uh, which is gonna work very similarly to that upper detector. They also both have lower SE detectors, and then they'll both have something called a compucentric stage which is going to allow you to rotate the stage itself around one single position. So if you, if you have a single particle that you want to get from its good side, then you can rotate the stage without losing that particle. So that can be very useful. And then last, they both have a vibration isolation table to help reduce excess noise from mechanical vibrations. And they both do technically have beam deceleration options. Uh, though the 4800 can only decelerate up to about 1.5 kV, whereas the 8030 can decelerate up to about 2.5. They both also have EDS detectors, but the 8030 has uh, the newer silicon drift detector and the Aztec software, whereas the 4800 still has the older uh, silicon lithium drifted detector and uses just an older Inca software package. So 4800 is also where the BioCryo is going to do some of their cryo SEM experiments. 
uh, because it has this li like a cryo stage. So you may see them using it every so often. And finally, the 8030 is going to have that low KV stem detector that sits under the stage that we talked about before. And then the 3400, which is also a Hitachi, but it's a little bit different than the other two. So this is our only tungsten filament SEM, so it's not as powerful as those cold field emission guns. But it's got a very large specimen chamber, so you can fit some pretty large samples in there. This one also has a compucentric stage, just like the other two Hitachis. Uh, and it's also got an ESED or environmental secondary electron detector for low vacuum mode. So if you have a sample that's charging, but it can't really be coded for one reason or another, then the low vacuum mode might be able to help out with that a little bit. The 3400 also has a permanently inserted backscatter detector, which is uh, segmented, which is really cool because you can do 3D reconstructions with it by getting different angles of your image. And then it's also got both a solid state EDS detector and an Oxford Wave 500 WDS system. All right, so moving on to the 7900 now. This is our newest microscope, and it's just got a ton of options for you to use. It is a Schottky Plus field emission gun, and it does have uh, that in-lens upper detector, just like the 4800 and the 8030. It also has a beam deceleration mode, but this one can decelerate the beam by up to 5 kV. Uh, so remember, the other ones were only 1.5 or 2.5, so it's like twice as powerful as that. It's also equipped with an electrostatic final lens, which lets you analyze magnetic materials, uh, but please consult with SEM staff members before you just go and put magnetic materials inside any of the SEM chambers. The backscatter detector on here uh, is going to be retractable, so you'll need to make sure that you insert that before you try to do any backscatter analysis or it won't go too well for you. And then the 7900 also has uh, both an EDS detector and an Oxford Wave 700 WDS system. And then last, it's got both a low vacuum mode and a low KV stem imaging using that stage insert, that polished gold reflective surface that we talked about before. So the 7900 has a lot of options, but I think the next SEM has maybe even more options to choose from. And that's going to be our Quanta 650F. So this is also a Schottky field emission gun, but let's read off all the detectors that it has attached. So it's got a standard lower secondary electron detector, it has a solid state concentric backscatter detector, which is retractable, so it'll need to be inserted. It's got two gaseous SE detectors, and a gaseous backscatter detector. Now it also does have a very large chamber. It has the largest of all of our SEMs and it does have a programmable stage. So it can move in steps for very easy large area analysis. It also has low vacuum mode where you can increase the pressure pretty high up to about 4,000 Pascals. And this one does have an EDS detector but it also has that EBSD detector that we mentioned. Um, that's for electron backscatter diffraction analysis. We also have an EBL setup, which includes a beam blinker, NPGS software, and has an integrated beam current measurement system. All right, and then lastly, it's got that Catan Murano heating stage and that cooling stage as well, which can be used for some very cool in situ experiments. All right, and those are going to be all of our SCMs here at Nuance. So we're excited to offer you all of these capabilities and more in the future. But I just wanted to touch on some of our sample prep instruments as well, because the most important part of microscopy is the sample prep. It doesn't matter how good of a microscopist you think you are. If your sample prep isn't good, you're not going to get good data. So here's a few of our sample prep instruments, starting with the osmium coater. Here, this machine lets you coat your sample with like a nanometer scale coating of osmium metal, which is a very highly conductive metal that offers a great uniform coating. And then we also have our Denton Desk 4 sputter coater. So this coater can coat with gold, gold palladium, and platinum. It also has an evaporative carbon coater attachment, which can be very useful for doing microanalytical work like EDS or WDS. And we're currently waiting on a piece to repair the Cressington sputter coater, but we're hoping to have that up and running soon. It works very similarly to the Desk 4, um, but it's got a few more options for coating. And lastly, we'll have two different sample cleaners. So we have the Hitachi Zone UV cleaner and the SBT PC2000 plasma cleaner. So both of these 
uh, can be used to clean off any dirt or dust that might have accumulated on your sample over time. And so those are always just great way to refresh your samples if they're ever just looking cruddy. All right, and that's going to be it for us today. I want to thank everybody who joined us here and everybody who helped put on this Tech Talk. And if anybody watched that and realized you just really need to get trained on all of the SEMs, you can use this QR code here on the right to fill out our SEM training survey. And if you'd like to learn more about any of those topics or techniques we talked about, you can follow these links here. So I hope everybody had a great day and wanted to thank you all for coming.